you don't know anything about me, um, I live in Mississippi. I grew up in Mississippi. I'm from Mississippi. I spent 10 years in Atlanta. So I've always been from the South. And that's my world. And I grew up Baptist. So what I'm going to be talking about is how to come out and how not to come out to friends and family if you're in a very religious context. What JT just got finished talking about was debate. And debate is, I think, one of the most valuable things that we do. And I, I, my appreciation for that has grown over the last couple of years. Initially, I think my response was, I don't think it's worth anything. Because like you said, maybe it doesn't change minds. But I don't think that's true. I think it does. And the difference is that where I am, I live in such a thick religious culture. And so many people in my life are very, very devout about their faith. That debate won't even really work in that setting. So what I'm talking about today is not about how to engage folks in a more uh, polemical way. I'm talking more about what do you do if you live in an environment where you're just now starting to identify as an atheist. So you're not being invited to debate and to discuss with someone who wants to disagree with you. You're just trying to just tell your family, I don't really believe anymore. And how many of y'all have done that before? Raise your hand. Okay, so you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, show of hands, how many of you think it went well? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of y'all, it did not go well? Okay, about half and half. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did mine terribly. I did it very, very well. And that's why I'm standing in front of you to tell you how to do it. Um, <laughs> Outgrowing Your Closet is a great name for this workshop. Because I don't think that you should just come out if you live in a very religious environment. If all of your key relationships are devout, I think it's a terrible idea, personally, to just come out. Unless you're looking to burn some bridges, in which case, maybe that's what you want to do. Maybe you're in an abusive situation. and Sometimes just leaving that situation is the only thing to do, right? But if you're trying to maintain relationships, because these are very close and personal, and you need them, especially if you're in a dependent situation with them, you don't want to just burn your bridges right away. There, there are ways that are better and ways that are worse of doing this. And so outgrowing your closet is a great thing to name it because what really should be happening is you should be taking the time to get to a place in your life where you're ready to do it. And you don't have to assume it has to be right away. Did you have that experience? Any of you identify with that, that it took time to come out? And you have to get more comfortable with where you are and with who you are. And I would recommend that personally. I'll explain more what I mean in a second, assuming that I can make this work right. Let's see. So if I hit the space bar, you would think that would make it work. Okay. Tell me if it starts advancing. Outgrowing your closet. The first thing I need to do, and there it goes, is tell you why it matters to come out. You know, I don't... I've never lived anywhere else. And so I speak about the world that I know. You know, I talk about what it's like coming out in the deep south and coming out to very religious friends and family. But when other people hear me talk about that or see me write about it, their response is, why does it matter? Why don't you just move on? You know, Why is this atheism thing even so important to you? Why do you let it define you? Has anybody asked you that? The reason is because everyone else is trying to make the alternative define me. And that's why I have to talk about this. Because I have to delineate, I have to differentiate between myself and my environment. It's the only way for me to claim my own life. Because the expectation is there, and it's universal, that you're supposed to be what they are. And if people are writing me from Oregon or Germany to tell me that I'm making too big of a deal out of my atheism, my response is, get out of my, my life. You know, this is not your responsibility. If you lived in my life, you would understand, this has to happen. I have to take the time to mark out some boundaries in my own life. And I'll explain more about what I mean by that in a minute. So coming out, it matters. And here's some, some reasons why it matters. Number one, because you should learn to feel at home in your own life. Your own life should be a place that you feel at home. And this is something I didn't see. Uh, and, and I want you to understand it too. If it's, if it's not a place, if you're not in a place where you can do that. Oh, your slide did not. Oh. Mm -hmm. See, I did the space bar thing. Tell me if it does it again. <clears throat> Atheism is just the beginning. Atheism is the answer to one question. Do you believe in gods? It's not a, a co comprehensive life stance. It doesn't answer all the questions of life. It doesn't tell you how to run a society. It may tell you how not to run a society, but by itself, it's not a comprehensive worldview. 
It's just an answer to one question. So it's just the beginning. I would also say that I'm a secular humanist. And I think many people that I know that are atheists would identify the same way. Part of being a humanist is that you know that this one life is all you get. And you want it to be the best life that you can have. You want to live your life to the fullest, which sounds like a Bible verse. You want to live your life to the fullest and have the best, the happiest life that you can. And you're not doing that if you're not at home in your own life. If you have to pretend that you're something that you're not, then you're not at home in your own life. And you owe it to yourself to learn to claim your own life. That's part of why it matters to come out. I didn't see that when I was a new unbeliever. After I deconverted, I just thought my goal was to try to swallow myself up and just erase anything about me that was different from everyone else. Because I was trying to reduce conflict. One of the reasons why I've not been big into debate is because I say I'm not a fighter, I'm a lover. You know, I'm not actually very good at it. When people confront me, I'm not very good at responding. So it's not that I don't think there's value in it, I just think I suck at it. But what I do want to do is maintain good relationships. And so, as a result, I've gone into the opposite ditch, which is that over time, I tried to squelch my differences and not tell anyone, to hide it and keep it in. And this was a terrible idea, because I never had a plan to exit it. Instead, I kept it to myself, and eventually it did come out, and when it did, it was bad. I didn't do a good job of managing it, and I want other people to have a better experience than I do. And I think the best way to do that is to take the time to outgrow your closet before you come out of your closet, if that makes sense. So you owe it to yourself, and I was so well programmed as a Christian to not think of self that it would have never occurred to me that it matters that I need to do what's good for me. Can you identify with that? I don't know what your brand of Christianity was, but mine was very absorbed in the concept of embracing the cross. You know, putting your own needs down and putting others above yours, which is a beautiful notion. It's very altruistic. But there should be some sort of balance. If you completely lose your own needs, it's going to come out some way or another. You're going to get burnt out, you're going to feel resentful, and it's going to hurt your relationships eventually. So again, this is why it matters that you need to learn to take ownership of your own life. And if you have it come out, it should be a goal of something that could be eventually done. All right, now this should not advance. It encourages others to self-identify. When you hear someone else whom you know, I said stop it. <laughs> Try the arrow keys. That's what I've been doing. Oh. And it just starts right back up again. Nice. When you see someone else come out, it emboldens you because now you know that somebody else is in the same boat you are. And Greg Christina has, has done a good job of explaining that this is what helped the LGBT movement over the years. It's just the act of self-identifying. It empowers others to step out and do it as well. And it also changes public perception because each new person that steps out and is a normal person, a functioning member of society, and says, actually, I'm an atheist, it adds strength to the others who are just waiting for somebody to do that, to help remove some of the stigma. And one of the things that... okay. There's just no way that I'm going to be able to do this without it messing up on me again. It helps loosen the stronghold, or the stranglehold, is whatever I said, stop, of fundamentalism. Now, if you don't live in the South, or if you don't live in a highly religious region, I said, stop it. <laughs> fundamentalism has been reaching and overreaching for a stronger place in American society, if you haven't noticed. There's a lot of people who have not appreciated this. Their opinion is, you know what, just ignore it. It's going to go away. It'll never survive in a scientific age. You're shaking your head because you know that's not true. Uh, the, the advent of the Internet did not kill religion. Now, granted, there hasn't been enough time, but I don't know if you've noticed, but the Internet is just as capable of promulgating nonsense as it is of, of, of you know, propagating the truth. It's just as likely to dispense idiocy. And so it's not enough just that information is out there. There is a, a reach happening among fundamentalists that's been going on for decades. They've been organizing for decades to influence the political process. They've been training lawyers. They've been training politicians. They've been training teachers. They've been homeschooling. And they've been building a, an alliance of people that's, that's had a groundswell over time. And some money has been poured into it. And it doesn't go away. And it's not going away. Uh, we're going to have to actually try to take away from some of its strength in society by stepping out. And when you step out and identify as an atheist, 
again, I'm going to quote Greta, Greta a lot because I've, I've been really helped by her writing. She said, religion requires social consent for its strength. In order to continue to have strength in society, it requires social consent. And you deny it, that consent, when you say, you know what, I'm actually not a member of that club. And you don't have to even say anything more than that. You don't even have to try to argue against the existence of God. Just by saying you're an atheist, you've automatically offended them. Because you just removed one person off their chart. You just removed consent. So, at, coming out of the closet helps everybody. It might even help turn the tide of some of what's trying to go, go on in, in, in our, our society. We've got people trying to remove uh, reproductive rights. We've got people continuing to fight for marriage equality, against marriage equality, I should say. And they're not going to quit. So, by stepping out and saying, you know what, I don't belong to your club. It helps them see, you know what, maybe we don't have the place of privilege we once did, and maybe we need to kind of reframe this and, and come at it a different way. Okay, outgrowing your closet. Here's my advice to people who are in situations that are more coercive. Maybe the religion is more of a dominant factor in your life, and the response is likely to be negative, and that's why you haven't come out. Number one, if you're financially dependent, my honest advice is don't do it. I've given this advice to people, and they didn't follow it, and then they, they were really sorry afterwards. Because people who love you, they still are going to interpret what loving you looks like based on their own ideas. And if their idea is that what you're doing and what you're thinking is bad for you, they're going to try to make you stop in whatever means they can. And one of my biggest problems that I had with the notion of hell is that it condones any behavior short of torture. If, if anything I do helps keep you from going to hell, then anything I do is legitimate short of torturing you, right? It justifies any kind of awful behavior. And that's why I have the biggest problem with the notion of hell, and I've gotten where I challenge it more directly than most. And in a way, it's kind of a, a, a tangential issue anyway. Uh, but maybe I'll get more to that in a second. If you're financially dependent, I wouldn't do it, because there's a good, ch there's a good chance that your family's going to use that against you. And sometimes it's not a matter of, um, it's not a matter of kicking you out of the home or uh, withholding, you know, whatever it is, if you're on some sort of salary with your family. But a lot of times it's just a matter of withholding gifts that they ordinarily would give you. You know, there's just a, a reduction in what they do for you. And it's very subtle. And I don't even think they know that they do it. I really don't. But there's this subtle belief that works in that says, things need to go bad for this person. They need to go bad so that they'll snap back to their senses and regain their faith. Some are more overt with it. Uh, a friend of mine who was a, uh, in, a, in a counseling situation for someone said, it's, it's good that he's in a bad situation. You don't need to help him out because he needs to wake up. He needs to see that he's, he's on a bad path. So it's, it's good if he's uncomfortable for a while. And, and you've got to understand, the person who said that is one of the most well-respected, kind people I know. But that, that notion works itself into even the sweetest people. Build a support network for yourself first, not afterwards. That's one of the things I did wrong. I didn't have anybody to talk to. And when I first came out to the people closest to me, I had nobody to turn to, which means that I didn't have any good advice sources for how to do it and how not to do it. My advice would be, number one, if you're financially dependent or, or greatly dependent in any other way on the people that you're getting ready to come out to, maybe hold off. Maybe wait till you're financially independent and then do this, if at all possible. Number two, make some friends online or in real life. If you don't happen to be in an area where you can find other atheists, you can find them online. That's one of the, the great things about the age that we live in now is we're able to find each other through social media. Build yourself a support network first and take the time to become more comfortable in who you are uh, because you've just been through a major change if you came from a highly religious environment. If possible, do it slowly. Now, I wish somebody had told me this. And not everybody does it this way, right? You, you know, the, the philosophy is... It's like a band-aid. Just rip it off and get it done as fast as you can. All right? A lot of people, that's just the way they prefer to do it, and maybe that's your way. Again, I, my suggestion is that's probably a bridge-burning thing to do. Probably. Unless you're in a situation where it turns out they were nowhere near as adamant about their faith as you thought they were. But if you're in a situation like mine, I know who's adamant and who's not. And I know good and well how they're going to respond. So if you know that it's going to be a negative response, then take your time. Don't hit it all at once. You know, uh, ease your way into it, kind of like circling the landing strip for a while, right? You just drop a comment here, drop a comment there, address an issue over here that's kind of tangential, 
uh, something on the circumference. Don't go straight for the whether Goddard exists or not, right? That's what I would suggest. Go slowly about it. Admit and embrace your uncertainty when it does come time to tell them. And use feeling words. These are the sorts of advice that I got afterwards. I wish I had gotten it before. You don't have to come out and say, there is no God. Now you've put them in a defensive situation. If it's a debate, that's a different situation. I'm talking about you're with your family. And this is very personal for them. And, and it, it upsets them. My suggestion is use feeling words. Say, I just I don't feel comfortable with this, or I don't really like that, or this thing here doesn't sit well with me. And do it in such a way that you don't challenge them to fight you as a response, to see you as a as a threat to them, if at all possible. Unfortunately, they may see you that way anyway. But do your best to maybe say, you know what, I'm not saying I'm certain about anything, because the thing is, you're probably not. I mean, most people would say, I can't say for certain about a lot of things. I just really persuaded against the idea. Empathize and try to remember how this would have struck you before. The longer you go, the harder it gets, right? The farther you get away from your own religious past, the harder it gets to remember how you ever thought that way. Have you had that problem? I, I, I find myself wanting to write as much as I can about it now, while I keep about it's still fresh. Because I can almost tell that 10 years from now, I'm going to say, I don't understand how I ever thought any of that stuff. Right now, it's still kind of uh, still fresh in my memory. But a friend of mine said something really good, and I want to I read to you what David said. He said, be prepared for them to possibly be vicious. And don't take it personally, if at all possible. By rejecting their religion, you are harming one of their deeply ingrained tribal markers. And they will not take that kindly. They will scrutinize your every moment, looking for clues for why you were never truly a part of their religion, possibly, why you are deeply flawed and can be led astray, or that you have an ulterior motive for rejecting their religion. Like, for example, you just want to have sex. Or, well, this is because you want to be gay. Like it's something you just chose to do one day, right? Uh, they will state their insights as blessings, even while the edge of their comments cut deeply into you. Please just take a breath, pause, and just remember that you used to think this way too. Let them vent. You won't change their minds at first. This is not a rational discourse. This is an emotional venting, an intellectual defense mechanism designed to maintain group identity. You hear what he just said? Your initial response that you get from them is not going to be the way they respond to you forever, necessarily. It might be, right? But this is fresh. You've just done something that to them feels like an injury. And you, you can just be prepared for the fact that in a lot of situations, they're going to retaliate. But take heart. It's, it's not the end. This is just the beginning. You give them time, and as soon as a week, they may be calming down and come back to this with more rational conversation. Some of y'all are nodding because maybe that was your experience. Be prepared that at first it might be vicious, but it does get better more often than not. As they spend time watching you and seeing that you're actually not nuts, and you're not going out and killing people, then, you know, they'll start making sense. Resist taking ownership of other people's reactions. This is my last two things. This one's huge, and I wish that I had known this. I wish somebody had sat me down and said, you can't control how others respond to you. You know, you can do your best to use feeling words, to take it slowly, and all the stuff I'm telling you. But the bottom line is, no matter how well you do this, they're still going to be hurt, some of them. And you can't control their responses, and you don't need to take ownership of it as if it's, as if it's your choice. You need to set boundaries and remember where your choices end and theirs begin. And the things that they do in response to you are not your responsibility. That's one of the hardest things for me to learn. And then finally, choose your media carefully. I think this is one of the things that Greta talks about. Uh, Decide what's the most appropriate situation. If it's a lot, a, a large network you're trying to alert to this situation, maybe maybe uh, Facebook makes sense. But of course, you, it's best not to maybe tell your folks by Facebook, if at all possible. I mean, what's wrong with that? Well, think about it. I mean, does, is that really the way you want them to find out? So take some time and think about who do you need to talk to in person about this, and who do you not? Who do you just want to just let them find out? Maybe you want to write it out. For a lot of people, writing this out in an email or as a letter gives the other person time to process this without having to have that face-to-face -face screaming match that can sometimes result from this sort of thing.